This Zoom is being recorded. The story is Skulking Permit by Robert Sheckley, episode one. Tom Fisher had no idea he was about to begin a criminal career. It was morning. The big red sun was just above the horizon, trailing its small yellow companion. The village, tiny and precise, a unique white dot on the planet's green expanse glistened under its two midsummer suns. Tom was just waking up inside his cottage. He was a tall, tan young man with his father's oval eyes and his mother's easygoing attitude toward exertion. He was in no hurry. There could be no fishing until the fall rains and therefore no real work for a fisher. Until fall, he was going to loaf and mend his fishing poles. It's supposed to have a red roof. Billy Painter was shouting outside. Churches never have red roofs. Ed Weaver shouted back. Tom frowned, not being involved. He had forgotten the changes that had come over the village in the last two weeks. He slipped on a pair of pants and sauntered out to a village square. The first thing he saw when he entered the square was a large new sign reading, No Aliens Allowed Within City Limits. There were no aliens on the entire planet of New Delaware. There was nothing but forest and this one village. The sign was purely a statement of policy. The square itself contained a church, a jail, and a post office, all constructed in the last two frantic weeks and set in a neat row facing the market. No one knew what to do with these buildings. The villages had gone along nicely without them for over 200 years, but now, of course, they had to be built. Ed Weaver was standing in front of the new church, squinting upward. Billy Painter was balanced precariously on the church's steep roof, his blonde mustache bristling indignantly. A small crowd had gathered. Damn it, man. I tell you, I was reading about it just last week. White roof, okay. Red roof, Never. You're mixing it up with something else. How about it, Tom? Tom shrugged, having no opinion to offer. Just then, the mare bustled up, perspiring freely, her shirt flapping around her ample girth. Come down. I just looked it up. It's the little red schoolhouse, not church house. Billy looked angry. He had always been moody, all painters were. But since the mayor made him chief of police last week, he had become downright temperamental. We don't have no little schoolhouse, Billy argued halfway down the ladder. We'll just have to build one. We'll have to hurry too. She glanced at the sky involuntarily Everyone in the crowd glanced upward, but there was still nothing in sight. Where are the carpenter boys? Sid, Sam, Mar, where are you? Sid Carpenter's head appeared through the crowd. He was still on crutches from last month when he had fallen out of a tree looking for Thrussell's eggs. No carpenter was worth a damn at tree climbing. The other boys are at Ed Beer's Tavern. Where else would they be? Mary oh, Waterman they... called from the crowd. Well, you gather them up. They got to build us a little schoolhouse and quick. Tell them to put it up beside the jail. She turned to Billy Painter, who was back on the ground. Billy, you paint that schoolhouse a good bright red, inside and out. It's very important. When do I get a police chief badge? 
I read that police chiefs always get badges. Make yourself one. The mayor mopped her face with her shirt tail. Sure hot. Don't know why that inspector couldn't have come in winter. Tom, Tom Fisher, got an important job for you. Come on, I'll tell you all about it. She put an arm around Tom's shoulders and they walked to the mayor's cottage past the empty market along the village's single paved road. In the old days, the road had been of packed dirt, but the old days had ended two weeks ago and now the road was paved with crushed rock. It made barefoot walking so uncomfortable that the villagers simply cut across each other's lawns. The mayor, though, walked on it out of principle. Now, look, Mayor, I, I'm on vacation. Can't have any vacations now. Not now. He's due any day. She ushered Tom inside her cottage and sat down in the big armchair, which had been pushed as close to the interstellar radio as possible. Tom. How would you like to be a criminal? I don't know. What's a criminal? Squirming uncomfortably in her chair, the mayor rested a hand on the radio for authority. It's this way. She said and began to explain. Tom listened, but the more he heard, the less he liked. It was all the fault of that interstellar radio, he decided. Why hadn't it really been broken? No one had believed it could work. It had gathered dust in the office of one mayor after another for generations, the last silent link with Mother Earth. 200 years ago, Earth talked with New Delaware and with Ford Four, Alpha Centauri, Nueva España, and the other colonies that made up the United Democracies of Earth. Then all conversations stopped. There seemed to be a war on Earth. New Delaware, with its one village, was too small and too distant to take part. They waited for news, but no news came. And then plague struck the village, wiping out three quarters of the inhabitants. Slowly, the village healed. The villagers adopted their own ways of doing things. They forgot Earth. 200 years passed. And then, two weeks ago, the ancient radio had coughed itself into life. For hours, it growled and spat static while the inhabitants of the village gathered around. Finally, words came out. <coughs> Hear me, New, hear me, New Delaware? Do you hear me? Yes, yes, we hear you. The colony is still there? It certainly is. The voice became stern and official. There has been no contact with the outer colonies for some time due to unsettled conditions here. But that's over, except for a little mopping up. You of New Delaware are still a colony of Imperial Earth and subject to her laws. Do you acknowledge the status? The mayor hesitated. All the books referred to Earth as the United Democracies. Well, in two centuries, Names could change. We are still loyal to Earth. Excellent. That saves us the trouble of sending an expeditionary force. A resident inspector will be dispatched to you from the nearest point to ascertain whether you conform to the customs, institutions, and traditions of Earth. What? The mayor was worried. The stern voice became higher pitched. You realize, of course, 
that there is room for only one intelligent species in the universe, man. All others must be suppressed, wiped out, annihilated. We can tolerate no aliens sneaking around us. I'm sure you understand, General. I'm not a general. I'm a mayor. You're in charge, aren't you? Yes, but... Then you are a general. Permit me to continue. In this galaxy, there is no room for aliens. None. Nor is there room for deviant human cultures, which by definition are alien. It is impossible to administer an empire when everyone does as he pleases. There must be order, no matter what the cost. The mayor gulped hard and stared at the radio. Be sure you're running an Earth colony, General, with no radical departures from the norm, such as free will, free love, free elections, or anything else on the prescribed list. Those things are alien, and we're pretty rough on aliens. Get your colony in order, General. The inspector will call in about two weeks. That is all. The village held an immediate meeting to determine how best to conform with the Earth mandate. All they could do was hastily model themselves upon the Earth pattern as shown in their ancient books. I don't see why there has to be a criminal. That's a very important part of Earth society. All the books agree on it. The criminal is as important as the postman, say, or the police chief. Unlike them, the criminal is engaged in antisocial work. He works against society, Tom. If you don't have people working against society, how can you have people working for it? There'd be no jobs for them to do. Tom shook his head. I just don't see it. Be reasonable, Tom. We have to have earthly things, like paved roads, all the books mention that, and churches, and schoolhouses, and jails, and all the books mention crime. I won't do it. Put yourself in my position. This inspector comes and meets Billy Painter, our police chief. He asks to see the jail. Then he says, no prisoners? I answer, of course not. We don't have any crime here. No crime, he says, but earth colonies always have crime. You know that. We don't, I answer. Didn't even know what it was until we looked up the word last week. Then why did you build a jail, he asks me. Why did you appoint a police chief? The mayor paused for breath. You see, the whole thing falls through. He sees at once that we're not truly Earth-like. We're faking it. We're aliens. Hmm. Tom was impressed in spite of himself. This way, I can say, certainly we've got crime here, just like on Earth. We've got a combination thief and murderer. Poor fellow had a bad upbringing and he's maladjusted. Our police chief has some clues, though. We expect an arrest within 24 hours. We'll lock him in the jail, then rehabilitate him. Well, let's rehabilitate. I'm not sure. I'll worry about that when I come to it. But now, do you see how necessary crime is? I suppose so. But why me? Can't spare anyone else. And you've got narrow eyes. Criminals always have narrow eyes. They aren't narrow. They're no narrower than Ed Weaver's. Tom, please. We're all doing our part. You want to help, don't you? Mm, I suppose so. 
Fine, you're our criminal. Here, this makes it legal. She handed Tom a document. It read, skulking permit. Know all men by these presents that Tom Fisher is a duly authorized thief and murderer. He is hereby required to skulk in dismal alleys, haunt places of low repute, and break the law. Tom read it through twice. What's law? I'll let you know as fast as I make them up. All Earth colonies have laws. But what do I do? You steal and kill. That should be easy enough. The mayor walked to her bookcase and took down ancient volumes entitled The Criminal and His Environment, Psychology of the Slayer, and Studies in Theft Motivation. These give you everything you need to know. Steal as much as you like. One murder should be enough, though. No sense overdoing it. All right. Tom I, nodded. I guess I'll catch on. He picked up the books and returned to his cottage. It was very hot, and all the talk about crime had puzzled and wearied him. He lay down on his bed and began to go through the ancient books. There was a knock on his door. Come in. Tom rubbed his tired eyes. Mark Carpenter, oldest and tallest of the red-headed Carpenter boys, came in, followed by old Jed Farmer. They were carrying a small sack. You the town criminal, Tom? Mar asked. It looks like it. Then this is for you. They put the sack on the floor and took from it a hatchet, two knives, a short spear, a club, and a blackjack. What's all that? Tom sat upright. Weapons, of course. You can't be a real criminal without weapons. Tom scratched his head. Is that a fact? You better start figuring these things out for yourself. Can't expect us to do everything for you. Mark Carpenter winked at Tom. Jed sore because the mayor made him our postman. I'll do my part. I just don't like having to write all those letters. Can't be too hard. Mark Carpenter grinned. The postmen do it on Earth, and they got a lot more people there. Good luck, Tom. They left. Tom bent down and examined the weapons. He knew what they were. The old books were full of them. But no one had ever actually used a weapon in New Delaware. The only native animals on the planet were small, furry, and confirmed eaters of grass. As for turning a weapon on a fellow villager, why would anybody want to do that? He picked up one of the knives. It was cold. He touched the point. It was sharp. Tom began to pace the floor, staring at the weapons. They gave him a queer, sinking feeling in the pit of his stomach. He decided he had to be, he decided he had been hasty in accepting the job, but there was no sense worrying about it yet. He still had those books to read. After that, perhaps he could make some sense out of the whole thing. He read for several hours, stopping only to eat a light lunch. The books were understandable enough. The various criminal methods were clearly explained, sometimes with diagrams. But the whole thing was unreasonable. What was the purpose of crime? Whom did it benefit? What did people get out of it? The books didn't explain that. He leafed through them, looking at the photograph faces of criminals. They looked very serious and dedicated, extremely conscious of the significance of their work to society. 
Tom wished he could find out what that significance was. It would probably make things much easier. Tom? The mayor called from outside. I'm in here, mayor. The door opened and the mayor peered in. Behind her were Jane Farmer, Mary Waterman, and Alice Cook. How about it, Tom? Uh, how about what? How about getting to work? Tom grinned self-consciously. I was going to. I, I was reading these books, trying to figure her out. The three middle-aged ladies glared at him, and Tom stopped in embarrassment. You're certainly taking your time reading. Everyone else is outside working. What's so hard about stealing? It's true. That inspector might be here any day now, and we don't have a crime to show him. All right, all right. He stuck a knife and, and a blackjack in his belt, put the sack in his pocket for loot, and stalked out. But where was he going? It was mid-afternoon. The market, which was the most logical place to rob, would be empty until evening. Besides, he didn't want to commit a robbery in daylight. It seemed unprofessional. He opened his skulking permit and read it through. Required to haunt places of low repute. That was it. He'd haunt a low repute place. He could form some plans there, get into the mood of the thing, but unfortunately, the village didn't have much to choose from. There was the tiny restaurant run by the widowed Ames sisters. There was Jeff Hearn's lounging spot. And finally, there was Ed Beer's tavern. Ed's place would have to do. The tavern was a cottage, much like the other cottages in the village. It had one big room for guests, a kitchen, and family sleeping quarters. Ed's wife did the cooking and kept the place as clean as she could, considering her ailing back. Ed served the drinks. He was a pale, sleepy-eyed man with a talent for worry. Hello, Tom. Here you're our criminal. Uh, that's right. Uh, I'll take a paracola. Ed Beer served him the non-alcoholic root extract and stood anxiously in front of Tom's table. How come you ain't out thieving, Tom? I'm planning. My permit says I have to hawk places of low repute. That's why I'm here. Is that nice? This is no place of low repute, Tom. You serve the worst meals in town. Oh, I know. My wife can't cook. But there's a friendly atmosphere here. Folks like it. That all change, Ed. I'm making this tavern my headquarters. Ed Beard's shoulders drooped. Try to keep a nice place. A lot of thanks you get. He returned to the bar. Tom proceeded to think. He found it amazingly difficult. The more he tried, the less came out, but he stuck grimly to it. An hour passed. Richie Farmer, Jed's youngest son, stuck his head in the door. You steal anything yet, Tom? Uh, not yet. Tom told him, hunched over his table, still thinking. The scorching afternoon drifted slowly by. Patches of evening became visibly through the tavern's small, not too clean windows. A cricket began to chirp outside, and the first whisper of night wind stirred the surrounding forest. Big George Waterman and Max Weaver came in for a glass of guava. They sat down beside Tom. How's it going? Uh, not so good. 
Tom said. Can't seem to get the hang of the stealing. You'll catch on. If anyone in this village could learn it, you can. We've got confidence in you, Tom. Tom thanked them. They drank and left. He continued thinking, staring into his empty pericola glass. An hour later, Ed Beer cleared his throat apologetically. <clears throat> it, it's none of my business, Tom. But when are you going to steal something? Right now. Tom said, and he stood up, made sure his weapons were securely in place, and strode out the door. Nightly bartering had begun in the market. Goods were piled carelessly on benches or spread over the grass on straw mats. There was no currency, no rate of exchange. Ten hand-wrought nails were worth a pail of milk or two fish, or vice versa, depending on what you had to barter and needed at the moment. No one ever bothered keeping accounts. That was one earth custom the mayor was having difficulty introducing. As Tom Fisher walked down the square, everyone greeted him. Stealing now, huh, Tom? Go to it, boy. You can do it. No one in the village had ever missed an actual No one in the village had ever witnessed an actual theft. They considered it an exotic custom of distant earth and wanted to see how it worked. They gathered their goods and followed Tom through the market, watching avidly. Tom found that his hands were trembling. He didn't like having so many people watch him steal. He decided he'd better work fast while he stood and still had the nerve. He stopped abruptly in front of Mrs. Miller's fruit-laden bench. Tasty-looking leafers. They are fresh. She was a small and bright-eyed old woman. Tom could remember long conversations she had had with his mother back when his parents were alive. They look very tasty. He wished he had stopped somewhere else instead. Oh, they are. I picked them just this afternoon. Is he, is he going to steal now? Sure is. Watch him. Tom picked up a bright green geefer and inspected it. The crowd became suddenly silent. This Certainly looks very tasty. Tom carefully replaced the geefer. The crowd released a long drawn sigh. End of episode one. Thank you very much. We hope you join us in two weeks on Zoom for our last